everyone to this live event on gender data for decision making. I am Hannah Brixi, the Global Director for Gender at the World Bank Group. And today we will hear from leaders and change makers on the power of data for gender equality. And marking the 10th anniversary of the World Development Report on Gender Equality and Development, we will also reflect on how far we have come over the past 10 years and how to accelerate progress on the way forward. And this is all part of our year-long Accelerate Equality initiative. And you can join us using the hashtag Accelerate Equality and the chat. Now, I am delighted to welcome World Bank Group President, David Malpass. President Malpass, you have made gender equality a top priority at the World Bank Group. Tell us, uh, how do you feel about the progress made? And uh, in your view, what have been some of the achievements on gender equality over the past 10 years in the world? Thanks, Hannah. Um there have been achievements, and I will say some of those, but I think we should all recognize in the context of uh, the challenges facing the world, both COVID and now uh, inflation, high prices, uh, and the food insecurity, um, the, 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 and, and the education setbacks that came out of COVID, um, that this is a very challenging uh, global environment for women and for girls and for the gender equality uh, agenda. So uh, you know, I I will go through some of the some of the progress, but it's in that context that uh, that I'm very concerned about uh, people in developing countries and and especially uh, women and girls. There are, have been achievements. The, for everybody's reminder, this started in 2012 with a with a World Development Report that had excellent traction, and so it it really went through how uh, important this was both from an economic development standpoint meaning women being half of the half of the potential labor force and half of the population and in many cases uh, much of the good decision making that's going on in families and even in government so that 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 gave a uh, full basis and platform and so as we look at it we've uh, uh, we we have seen improvements in legal structures uh, we you know we've got data and data is really important in this to track and to build evidence of how the progress is made so we see we show that 153 countries have in, introduced we were counting 373 reforms towards gender equality over the past decade so that's good in including in middle east and north africa uh we, we we're showing 17 countries have introduced 57 reforms okay so that's good and that's some evidence of the forward progress uh there's there's also legislation on domestic violence we know that the range of uh, gender equality or uh, related issues is broad from uh, violence to the legal structure of uh, of the business laws of the inheritance laws of the governance laws uh, that that allow uh, women to be involved in development but also uh, in terms of their their uh, rights within the country's systems so it's a broad agenda we see that there had been progress being made on maternal mortality some part of this is is uh just the uh, uh the challenges of childbirth and the particular challenges of women being the uh, uh the 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 uh the the weaker uh, or the within some of the legal structures of the world and therefore uh, uh being being under particular challenges this of course applies to girls uh there's been some improvement in girls enrollment in secondary schools um so i wanted to go through that uh hana uh the the you know the human capital index uh was a uh, was we've had the world uh the women business and the law report and the human capital index uh both of which fully recognizing 
the importance of women within uh, women and girls within development, within education and health. Uh, and so it's good to see progress. We're trying to make more progress on digitalization, recognizing that in many cases, women and girls are some of the biggest uh, beneficiaries because it allows connectivity that they might not be able to get within their cultural structure of their of their countries. And so if as we can push forward, we've uh, we've continued to push financial inclusion and broadened the that the concept away from bank accounts and more toward digital transactions, which are are, are uh, and and cell phone based transactions, which are highly empowering for women and for girls and for new business entrants into the economy. So that's a major theme of what we've what we've done. So let me stop there, but with to, to summarize, it's a very difficult environment for women and girls. There's been a backtracking uh, and we want to really uh, restart the forward progress. Thanks. Thank you so much, President Malpa. So as you illustrated, the agenda is broad and also there are many actors involved from communities to civil society to national governments uh, and also international development partners. So I would like to ask you, President Malpas, to offer your reflections on how the World Bank Group has evolved in supporting uh, countries to advance uh, uh, gender equality. I'll mention two parts of it, how we've evolved inside the bank, and then how does that impact and, uh, and complement what we're trying to do with countries. So within the bank, uh, as, as many people that have worked at the bank know, women have been an important part of it increasingly, and the bank leading in some ways on, on gender equality issues. And that shows up in the uh, high number of uh, women in senior positions with the bank. And I've seen it, in, you know, we now have a majority of the, of the uh, senior leadership team is, uh, is women. Uh, we've seen uh, the, 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 at the vice president and the director level, those numbers go up, but also the, uh, and be high, I mean, be a majority, uh, uh, a majority. And a, that gets incorporated in a full recognition by me, but by, I think, everyone in the bank, that uh, women are, uh, involved, so it, women are fully part of the decision making process and often are making better decisions. You know, I was just at the G7 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting uh, last week. So on Friday, just three days ago, I was at, at, at the at the meeting and there was uh, uh, Janet Yellen and there was uh, Christine Lagarde. There was uh, uh, Christia Freeland, the, the Canadian uh, minister. Uh, Kristalina Georgieva was sitting right beside me. And, there, and uh, there is the full recognition that countries that have gender, more gender equality are growing faster. So, you, you know, there's, uh, there's strong reinforcement around the, the world of that and a recognition that the World Bank generates uh, strong senior leaders uh, uh, th that are in mid-level leaders that are that are women uh, which gives a strength to the international system as a whole. Now turning to countries then that means that uh, you know World Bank more so I think than many organizations and institutions has senior women at the country director level at the uh, at the business levels, uh, encouraging good policies within the countries. So as we interact with the countries, it's often uh, a, uh, a in in countries that do have women in senior positions, they're very comfortable working with the World Bank, uh, women and men, uh, to change the legal structures in a positive way. We've been you know very happy with the success in Tanzania as a woman president takes over. You get better outcomes almost very quickly and a better um, method of, of doing, uh, doing interaction. So we're, we're building on that. And that's true around the world. Um, we've, we've, you know, we're involved, engaged in this realignment of staff to have more people in the field. And so that often means, uh, means uh, more strong women in the field, which helps, helps uh, create uh, the better programs, which is our you know, our mission is to have good development outcomes for people 
uh, in developing countries, including and especially women and girls. And so with that as a goal, that means uh, having people on the ground that are fully part of that system is important. It's the right thing to do. I'll give you a couple examples. You, people know the Sahel Women's Empowerment and Demographic uh, Dividend Project, which has been, it started in 2015, it's been successful and we've re, we've expanded it uh, multiple times, which is what I'm trying to find scalable programs, ones that start maybe with 10,000 people positively affected and then become, you know, can hope to become 10 million people positively in, uh, affected. So we're, we're uh, continuing to test new interventions Clearly, I mean, the Sahel uh, it, it, uh, exemplifies the challenge that women and girls are facing. Um, and can I come back? I mentioned earlier, but I'll say it again. The, uh, the setbacks from COVID are big in, um, on education. We've seen it in the data. The literacy data goes uh, uh, illiteracy data. Uh, uh, challenges. But what we know is that when girls are allowed in school, they test better and do better than the boys. But when when you look at the numbers, they drop out sooner and they uh, they uh, are are not re-invited back to school after a crisis. So one of the problems we're facing after COVID is that I visit schools in most of the countries that I go to just this year, in the last few months, I've been in schools in uh, uh, Morocco, also in Romania, and in, in Poland, I saw refugee children. Um, and so we see innovative school programs as being a critical part of this uh, uh, gender equality uh, um, uh, uh, approach that we're taking. One other thing I'll mention, and then uh, back to you, is uh, within IDA, it is a unique um, kind of uh, uh, instrument because for in many ways, uh, one is its leveraging capabilities, but also the, the dialogue that we have between debtors and donors, or I mean, uh, uh, users of IDA and the donors to IDA is a regular three-year process that's structured and that really ends up with strong input from the donors that uh, is heard by the uh, by the users. And one key area of that is the uh, gender equality uh, commi commitments that are in the new IDA 20. So that that means that there'll be there'll be particular uh, focus on that throughout our country programs and throughout our um, actual projects. Thanks. Thank you, President Malpas, for these illustrations of really increased investments and, and commitments to gender equality at the World Bank Group. And so now let's perhaps shift gears. So we've talked about the past 10 years and, and recent challenges. Now looking into the future, let's say the next 10 years, uh, what would you see as the priorities to, to achieve gender equality and women's empowerment? Uh, we've, I've mentioned some of them. Well, one is uh, having the World Bank have as good a, uh, programs uh, in countries as possible and data and evidence to support that and to see which ones are really working. In Morocco, I saw that a, they are using uh, uh, NGOs or CSOs to to, uh, uh, to do the preschool um, the the preschool. Sorry, my phone is going off. Um, to do the preschool and um, and it's working well. They have two hundred thousand kids in preschool, which um, make m prepares them well for the schooling system because they've had. You know, the countries are facing this problem of early dropouts by girls. And so uh, having them have a stronger start and the families be engaged is critical. So as I look forward, you know, education of girls is going to be uh, a top priority, obviously, n nutrition and share sharing of, of resources during the food. The current food crisis is going to be vital that uh, girls are not left out. Um, and I think the, this digitalization as part of empowerment and also, I mean, digital transactions are available to women where a bank account may not be available or a trip to the city may not be available, but the digital information can be available. And also social safety nets can be run through uh, through those. So I think we, we need to have a, a high 
priority on pushing that forward. Um, the, the legal structures for the countries are important in terms of uh, 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 violence against women being being uh, illegal for one uh, and being enforced uh, as an illegal and there being uh, protections in terms of women uh, able to get to their jobs in a safe way. This is a this is a high priority and that means investments. But it 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 seems as if these are not expensive investments by the global standards and they they give quite a bit of uh, uh, payoff. We'll be doing a lot more, and I know Mamta is on today on uh, pandemic preparedness and health health preparedness, and that gets into the very important uh, role of uh, women health uh, in in uh, in in uh, systems, and so that that's that's a priority, and particularly when it's under as much pressure as it is now, the family planning. Uh, uh, parts of the health system are going to be critical in the quality of life uh, for women. You, and, you know, a lot of this just is really a broad agenda. If we think of, uh, as we know from the data, the evidence uh, that one of the uh, one of the big challenges women face is they have to, they're the, they and their girls are the ones that walk to get the water. And if there's not water that comes to the home, it takes up hours of the day and is uh, and is a, a dangerous part of their daily activity and yet necessary uh, for 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 the family. And so having uh, the last mile or the last uh, 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 half a mile um, for water is a is a critical priority for countries such as uh, in uh, well, all around the world. Um, I was going to say India, but it's not. It's it's uh, it's true in many of the developing countries that we need better access to water and to electricity as a way to make um, a role for women and girls more uh, more available. Um, okay, I and you know we're we are uh, continuing to push. Uh, for, uh, on the governance structures of communities uh, so that women are involved. That My impression is that many countries uh, kind of understand this agenda and uh, so we can, we can attack head on the resistance spots uh, in the world. And then uh, it, part of this agenda I think needs to be persistence, doing it year after year, steadily through country programs with strong uh, well-placed women in the World Bank that uh, that uh, are particularly good at pushing forward the agenda, but everyone doing it together. Thanks. Thank you so much, President Malpass. Perhaps, uh, you know, I would add that uh, with the data and the knowledge now, countries are in a much better position than 10 years ago to, to develop and adapt solutions and, and measure progress. And you know, when you look at the World Bank Group uh, gender strategy with its four, four pillars, human endowments, jobs, assets, and voice and agency, the strategy remains relevant, but lessons learned in, in dealing with the persistent challenges you mentioned, the uh, female labor force participation, uh, gender-based violence, and also the new context, uh, food security, climate change, now, these call for, I would say, more transformative uh, solutions to boost, especially women's economic empowerment, uh, resilience, and leadership. And this implies, uh, as you highlighted, an emphasis on institutions and gender smart approaches to development. You know, to advance institutions toward a transformative change, countries can address the remaining formal constraints to equality, uh, build capacity in government, in the private sector, in the civil society to drive for equality and help communities shift norms, for example, by engaging community leaders and men to accept more equal uh, gender attitudes. And gender smart approaches also can help uh, reduce fragility, uh, improve food security and deliver on other important outcomes. You know, evidence shows us uh, how, how bundling cash with information and services targeting women can improve farm productivity, entrepreneurships, or nutrition outcomes. 
and how women's participation in community decision-making contributes to social cohesion, service delivery, or climate smart investments. So coming back to your point, President Malpass, about the importance of data. Now, as we know, women's status and voice are often not adequately reflected in, in the official statistics. So how has the World Bank Group helped improve gender data? We're, so there are a number of ways. One is to have partnerships and to listen to outsiders as far as what the data is needed. Then in the countries, we work with the national uh, data offices, and that's that's part of the program that we're trying to put together now to uh, or that we have to strengthen. You, you, I might give people a little background. You, we have a we, we in order to work against fragmentation of. Uh, of development programs by all the various uh, donors in the world who want to be involved in gender issues, we, we, we do a number of things to try to pull together the various uh, donors and programs. One is to uh, have uh, country platforms, meaning at the country level to have the World Bank lead or uh, the World Bank follow. If there's a strong other leader in the development community in the countries or a strong minister uh, within the country's govern government, uh, have have, have a convening process in the country to talk about how to pull the programs together. So I wanted to mention that. And then we're also uh, trying to have umbrella programs for the trust fund so that there's not a fragmentation uh, that, uh, that really reduces the efforts. Um, and then you mentioned, and I was happy uh, you did, Hannah, the, uh, the, the cash plus kind of co concepts were bundling, uh, you know, money or it's some access to some amount of money is highly empowering for for women and having having a way to to do that and then to move it in the right directions of nutrition of education of her own uh, uh, reading skills maybe uh, those those all I think work together so we're working with the national statistical offices uh, to and and multilateral partners uh, and internally uh, to support high quality, accurate, and timely gender data. So I'm, I'll maybe come back to you, Hannah, on the on the gender portal. And uh, I know that the conversation today is going to be highlighting specific ways uh, that we can we can bring evidence and data to bear on these problems. Indeed, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, uh, to advance uh, and measure outcomes, we need to have relevant gender data. And, and for example, for women's empowerment, we need to have data on unpaid care work, uh, on gender differences in access to the internet, financing and other services in asset ownership, uh, from land to mobile phones. And these are all the kind of data that are being captured through the new gender data portal. And everyone is now able to access the portal and the data is presented in a way that is easy to use by policymakers, by journalists, activists, as well as uh, researchers. And in fact, we will have a small preview of the portal at the end of the, of the event today. Uh, so perhaps I'll come back to uh, you, uh, President Malpass, with some final reflections before we uh, close and uh, turn to, to the panelists that uh, will share some examples on how they use data in their efforts. Um, thanks. Well, this is great. I mean, having the data and having it accessible um, to, to the, the global community is a core part of the knowledge bank uh, side of the World Bank that that has tried to do it for low cost, meaning not, you know, it's not a, it's a cost center for the bank. And yet we recognize the value. So that, uh, that takes me to the concept of global public goods, which this is a gender portal is one form of global public goods. And we're doing lots more thinking about how the bank uh, or the recognition of the reality of the world is many of the things that the World Bank does are uh, global public goods. They're in a way you can think of them as a cost center or a, a uh, uh, an expenditure that we know is useful uh, beyond the country programs. Um, and that can uh, clearly involve 
climate issues where the benefits go to the to the world and the cost uh, uh, can be can be shared in some way uh, by the global community. It's also uh, very apparent in the refugee uh, 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 crisis, which cross borders, and also in the uh, uh, very much uh, visible in the vaccination. The value to the world of vaccination is high. Uh, and so we're fighting uh, with regard to COVID-19 vaccines, fighting the hesitancy there, but it applies to all, all, all sorts of health-related initiatives where we recognize uh, that there's, there's a, a huge benefit to the world uh, that, and therefore needs to be financing mechanisms. IDA, in a way, is doing that automatically, is often financing things that are good for the world through donors that, that share that view. Um, so with that, I'm glad to see gender, uh, the gender uh, data portal, uh, but also the, the broader agenda clearly has uh, benefits uh, across country borders and something that the World Bank is fully invested in. Thanks. Uh, indeed, uh, President Malpass, and we will hear from, from uh, our panelists some exciting examples how this global public goods is serving uh, for uh, campaigns as well as policies and, and programs in countries. So, so I would like to thank you, President Malpass, uh, for your reflections. And uh, I would like to turn to my colleague Haishan Fu, director at the World Bank uh, Group's uh, Data Development Group. Thank, thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Haisha. Thank you, thank you, President Malpass. So, so uh, over to you, Haisha. Thank you so much, Hannah and the President Malpass for such an enlightening opening dialogue. It truly is inspiring and uh, reassuring, I must say, to know that the World Bank Group is so strongly committed to promoting and investing in gender equality, especially at this critical time when the COVID pandemic along with other global crises are eroding the progress since the WDR on, on, on gender was launched a decade ago and threatening to widen gender inequalities. So urgent actions are needed, but these actions must be guided by the right gender data and insight they provide. So let's carry this timely conversation further by turning to a wonderful group of uh, panelists whom I will introduce shortly. We will have two panel discussions. The first will focus on evidence-informed policy making based on gender data. And the second will explore how we can change mindset and collaborate to tackle gender inequality with the impactful use of gender data. So a big warm welcome to all our panelists and thank you for joining us today to share your thoughts. Let me open the first panel with His Excellency Minister Mohammed Maid, Minister of Finance of the Arab Republic of Egypt. Your Excellency, what a pleasure to have you with us today. We know that Egyptian government has made considerable effort to enhance women's and girls' financial inclusions, uh, as well as their agency over the past few years. So if you could share with us briefly the latest reforms your government has undertaken in supporting gender equality and how you have been informed by the underlying data and evidence. Please, Thanks. Your Excellency. Thanks. Hello, and thank you for the invitation to be on uh, this panel with regard to gender data for decision making. And let me uh, briefly give the evidence about what the uh, Egyptian government has been doing in order to ensure that we have uh, gender equality. And let me say that uh, uh, from uh, decades that uh, 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 we changed our laws to ensure equal uh, treatment and equal rights for uh, women and men. I remember the latest uh, one, which was uh, 20 years ago, when, uh, or even more, when women were given the right to divorce men, which was uh, something we felt uh, very happy that uh, our law changed to allow women to divorce men. This is number one. Number two, I believe that uh, uh, in the latest uh, 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 movement led by the president of the Tai Sisi, that our parliament now is uh, uh, minimum 25% of uh, MPs are women. Uh, uh, our government is more than 25% women. Uh, we have 
through the first time of Egypt history to have governors of uh, uh, our government, women, uh, also uh, women empowerment to allow them to be vice minister and uh, vice uh, uh, governors, uh, and also uh, 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 the latest uh, movement that uh, 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 women allowed to be judges uh, in our, all our uh, uh, legal um, institutions. Uh, the latest one, which was, uh, I think, a few months ago, the State Council. Uh, this was the latest to uh, great uh, women to become judges in the, cities, in the State Council, uh, which is uh, the administrative court for uh, Egypt. Uh, I believe also um, uh, uh, all the ministries in Egypt must have uh, what we call it equal uh, opportunities unit when uh, this unit uh, has the power to ensure that uh, women are treated equally uh, uh, and uh, if there is anything they can uh, address it. At the, at the national level, we have this National Council for Women, which looks uh, look at uh, any uh, 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 women issue and ensuring that uh, uh, if there is any uh, issue, uh, it is raised to the highest level of the country. Uh, President and the Prime Minister, uh, I believe the current uh, um, uh, situation uh, is very favorable and uh, uh, we are changing continuously our law to ensure that if anything comes up uh, 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 with regard to women, uh, 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 we will change our law to uh, ensure that uh, this uh, is dealt with. And I believe that a few weeks ago, our President was talking about uh, uh, women and uh, ensuring that they get the, the best treatment in their houses uh, 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 from their families and uh, they look after very well. So, again, uh, if I address uh, uh, some of the issue, which is, uh, 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 for example, uh, it's a gender gap uh, index issued by the World Economic Forum. Uh, and it's the latest issue of 2020. Egypt was ranked 174 out of 100. 53 countries with an index value reaching 63%, noting that the higher uh, the index value, uh, the lower the gender uh, gap. And also with regard to gender inequality uh, indicators issued by the United Nations Development Program, uh, and these indicators consist of five basic variables in the field, which uh, 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 re, uh, re, uh, reproductive health, the empowerment and the labor market and the, the aims uh, at measuring the inequality and the distribution of opportunities between the two genders. The indicator for Egypt reached 0.449 according to the latest report issued in 2020 compared to 0.45, 0.45 in 2018, which means that Egypt uh, uh, is under and the eighties out of 156 countries included in the index of 2020, not exactly that. The lower the index uh, uh, reaches, the smaller the gap between uh, males and the females. Uh, for the digital gender gap, uh, with the digital transformation provides ways for women uh, economic empowerment by giving women the possibility to earn additional income and increase job opportunity and access to knowledge and general information. Uh, the limited ability of females to access digital services is a major obstacle to achieve their economic uh, uh, empowerment. But our Ministry of Communication and Information Technology, the digital gap in Egypt for internet service in 2020 reached 8.5%. And the usage of smartphones by males uh, is 10% higher than the females. And the usage of uh, computer is 5.2% uh, higher. For women uh, in the business uh, and uh, uh, low index issued by the World Bank, uh, the only bank uh, presents a report entitled Women, Business, and Law, which aims to at comparing uh, the level of gender uh, discrimination system in the field of economic and development and entrepreneurship uh, uh, bank at uh, the level of 190 uh, countries around the world. Egypt ranked in this index according to the latest report issued in 2021 for the period of September 2019 to 20, October 2020, 178 position, with a total of 45 points out of 100 points. Uh, Egypt comes in the 10th uh, place in the Arab world, according to the data of the World Bank. Egypt has witnessed also a remarkable improvement in this indicator, 
as uh, index rose from 38.8 point, uh, 38 .8 points in 2015 to 45 in 2017 and 75.2. Let me say, as a Ministry of Finance, we have these equal opportunities uh, for women, and also we issue uh, gender-based budgeting, uh, uh, which uh, looks after how our budget is uh, moving uh, with regard to female uh, looking after. Uh, also, we think that we're going to issue a gender bond. We are in the preparation to issue uh, such a gender, a gender bond in order to prove that we are moving in this direction. So let me conclude that uh, in Egypt, we are trying very hard and we believe that uh, we made a good progress. And as a final group, that if you come to Ministry of Finance, you will find that uh, the majority of my assistant and uh, my colleagues working with me are for me. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayit. It's, it's, it's just so heartening to see the progress and the new policies and initiative you've uh, introduced uh, right in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, I'm sure they will have a long lasting impact in terms of promoting uh, progress towards greater gender equality. And also wonderful to hear that World Bank's uh, global public goods such as women business and law uh, has served to inform uh, your government's action. So thank you so much. Now let's, let's now turn to uh, Mr. Papa Sack, Director of Research and Data and UN Women. Papa, you know, we have been working in this field for so long together. It's always wonderful to have you in this discussion. And we know that the World Bank and UN Women have a long history of working together to promote gender equality, including through uh, supporting uh, gender uh, initiatives. Uh, most recently, um, your uh, rapid uh, gender assessment uh, and uh, on the impact of the COVID pandemic on women and men and the World Bank's supported high frequency phone service in client countries are really complementing each other to help inform the government. So uh, taking this opportunity, I'd like to ask you to share with us some of the insight from your rapid gender assessment and how UN Women has been working with the governments and other partners to implement policies and programs, taking into account the considerations from these surveys. Uh, thank you very much, Haishan, and uh, thanks to Hala and colleagues for inviting me to speak about uh, this topic that is really dear to my heart. And it's great to see you again, by the way. Uh, it's been quite a while. Uh, so uh, at UN Women, as soon as the pandemic was declared, we recognize that good and timely gender data was key to the response. And uh, uh, this is partly because of experience of how past crises have affected women, but also the measures that were being taken, such as stay at home orders, which as we all know, can be as perilous for women who are victims of or are at a risk of domestic violence. So despite the challenges faced by national statistical systems, there was really uh, an opportunity for us to innovate and to explore new approaches to address the increasing demands for timely data on the impact of COVID-19. This is why we started the Rapid Gender Assessment Service in April 2020, and as you've highlighted, have conducted over 78 of them around the world. But we've also collected data on even the policies that countries were enacting to see how they were addressing the, uh, the, the needs of women. So really looking at the impact, but also the policies, the impact of policies that were being, uh, being implemented. And so the results of the RGA's uh, Rapid Gender Assessment Surveys, as we call them, have uh, been used by many countries to develop targeted programs to address the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19. And Haiti, you know, in Haiti, for example, the RGA was used to inform the gender sensitive humanitarian response and recovery during the 2021 earthquake. And we are using similar methodologies now in Ukraine, really you know, going even beyond the COVID-19 pandemic, but using the same tools to address uh, emergencies. And working closely with partners made the use of this data possible. By partnering with national statistical offices and gender ministries to address the press, their pressing information needs, we ensured that the data was nationally owned, but also used to inform policies. And I'm also happy to learn that, as you pointed out, that the bank uses the results of these RGAs for its own analysis and operations. And this is also not a coincidence. Uh, we've collaborated very closely with the bank as part of the RGA's design. Uh, 
and have also worked closely on gender data dating back at least a decade when UN Women's work in this area was just starting. I'm also personally delighted to have served on the advisory group, a panel of the revamped gender data portal, which is an excellent resource for which I, I do congratulate again the bank. And finally, let me just close with one short reflection. Uh, we know that gender, the gender statistics has historically suffered from a lack of prioritization by statistical systems at all levels, whether it's national, regional, or global. And it shows in the limited data that is currently available to monitor the, the gender-related SDG targets. However, thanks to the great work that many organizations, such as ours, the World Bank and UN Women and others, have done, we are seeing much greater demand from countries. The demand is really much stronger, whether you know, we're talking about time use surveys or gender in the environment or you know, air, air violence against women or any other topics. We need to keep this momentum. And you know, the lessons that we've learned through the pandemic point to an immediate need to step up our support, both technically, but also importantly, by increasing investments in gender data, both domestically and internationally. And I really look forward to continuing this conversation with the bank and other partners to find the pressing solutions needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Papa. You know, we are really uh, enjoying our fruitful partnership and really looking forward to do much more together. Uh, now, let me, let me turn to Rima Nanayati, the Director of Self-Employed Women's Association in India. Rima, I am really thrilled to have you on the panel with us today because your leadership and experience over the past few decades has led to more fair and equal opportunity for thousands of self-employed women in India. You once said that data has now become a tool to increase the collective strength and bargaining power of women. It speaks to me deeply, and I think it really captures the spirit of this entire event. So let me invite you to share with us, what is your approach to working with the different stakeholders, such as government, private sector, academia, and others, to enable evidence-based policy reform, including through advocating for the importance of improving data about women workers in the informal economy? Thank you so much. And thank you, Mamtaji and Hannah and Hashan for giving uh, voice to the uh, need of data for the informal sector of women workers. Data is an emerging important tool, as we see, in organizing poor and women and help them or support them come out of poverty. Um, this has been clearly realized and validated by the Global Commission on Future of Work of ILO, more recently the UN Food System Summit, and even more so the pandemic has shown us how to an extent this is possible. Um, use of data has been a very important ingredient uh, of organizing. Seva's birth took place when a survey of textile mill workers and their families was done. And it was found that women of these mill worker families were working in the informal sector and very often self-employed. So today we have our own application which gives us real time data on the renewal of membership, on their trade, on the income levels and the government entitlements. It helps us in targeting. Similarly, the birth of Seva Bank, one of the largest self-employed women workers bank in the world today, came out of the savings pattern of the poor self-employed women workers who were Seva members. So today, uh, the Seva Bank has developed a whole mobile-based application that helps in real-time data management as well as flow of cash. More examples can be found all across in the last 50 years. And currently, as we speak, SEVA is conducting a six -er state survey to find the impact of the pandemic on the SEVA members. 120,000 cotton farmers are being surveyed to find ways and means of turning them towards ecosystem-based cotton farming. Um, I can go on and on, the list is much longer. But in the end, I would like to point out that you know, the bank has done commendable work in this field of data and gender equality. 
And uh, I think um, the bank must help organizations like SEVA to consolidate such data that is existing by investing not only in consolidation, but encourage common ownership and easy access to such data, not by the other stakeholders alone, but by women and the workers and jointly co-creating knowledge for data systems of, by, and the poor women. It is, this is what we call the bottom-up AI, which becomes a bargaining tool. How do women own and create their own algorithms? So I'll be writing to you and to Mamta Ji and to Hannah in this regard on behalf of all such organizations on using data to organize poor and women. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Rima. Uh, it's, it's really, really wonderful to hear what you have been pushing for in, in, in the ground. And, and also we'd love to collaborate with you. So we will be following up with each other. So on, on that wise words, uh, let, let me turn to the second panel. Uh, as we all know, having gender data available is critical, but to make them really impact change, we really need to make sure that this data are actually used, understood and used effectively by different stakeholders from policymakers to gender advocates to researchers and the journalists. So that's why it's, it's my pleasure to now turn to our second panel on changing mindset and collaborating um, to accelerate progress. I will start the panel with uh, Michael Frederick, who is also called Mick, who is co-founder and the Chief Policy Impact and Government Relations Officer and at Global Citizen. Mick, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we know that Global Citizen harnesses the power of the enormous global community to push for action on climate change, poverty, and inequality. Um, I really would like to hear from you how you see that we can curate and communicate data to the right people for decision making and how we can ensure that this data are understood properly and used effectively for the cost that you are leading. Yeah, well, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, literally, um, we're here in New York at the Global Citizen Now Summit. And literally, we just came from here in Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados um, on, on stage. And she actually made a point um, as, as it relates to, to data, right? Like, you know, at the end of the day, as, as advocates, those of us um, pushing for policy change, we can make our arguments far more robust, far more resonant with not just policymakers, but the big financial institutions, if we can link this back to economic impact. And she was making it in the, in the context of antimicrobial um, resistance, but I think you can easily also make the case in the argument when, uh, when it applies to gender equality. The reality is, is when we look at the costs that this will have to the global economy, you know, in the future, if we put off making the investments today, we're going to pay more later. And I think, you know, meeting with, with finance ministers, you're equipping advocates. I mean, ultimately, we're, we're a citizen-led organization, right? We say citizen-led accountability is, is key to delivery. So one of the things I always push for is making sure that the data points don't just sit in reports and in talking points, but how do we actually get that out to artists? We were talking about how do we equip those in popular culture? How do we equip those, uh, equip those at the grassroots to use those points so that they can hold their policymakers to, to account and the feet to the fire? And I would say the other point is, is, you know, unfortunately in the times we live in, you know, it's all well and good for our political leaders to give platitudes, make nice comments, right? We can all say we want to address climate change, but unless we actually get into the hard points of solving these issues, you know, it, it's really hard to hold leaders accountable and to, to know what's true and what's not. Data is the, is if you like, the, the disinfectant of sunlight that shine, shines out on, on the truth. That's really what data is, is about from our experience as, as advocates. Thank you so much, Mick. I, I love the way you describe uh, how important data is in such a poetic way. And I, 
I am really uh, enjoying what the insight you shared. And now let, let, let me turn to Gary Barker, the CEO and co-founder of Mondo US. Gary, we're really delighted to, to have you with us today. Um, as you work engaging men and boys in advancing gender equality, changing social norms is absolutely groundbreaking. And we all know that social norms remains a barrier to, uh, for us to achieve greater progress towards gender equality. And, and your work focuses on ensuring that men and boys are engaging in this conversation to truly move the needle on gender equality. So we really would love to hear from you how you have used data and evidence from surveys you developed on men's attitudes and behavior related to violence, fatherhood, and gender equality to change mindsets of communities about men and women, boys and girls. And, and what is your advice for leaders connected here today or beyond on how to tackle the issue of social norms to enhance programs and uh, policies to improve gender equality? The floor is yours. Sure, thanks for those questions and for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. Um, you know, through we've been using data for about 15 years in a survey called the International Men and Gender Equality Survey, or IMAGES, which we've carried out with country partners now in nearly 50 countries. And using that as a conversation to say, this is not just men and boys um, saying they're on board, but really, do we see proof um, in their attitude change and also in behaviors? Um, and that's, of course, a huge challenge. Um, where we've used the data, just to give a couple of examples, and good to hear your president talk about, you know, we want to see these taken to large enough scale to make a difference. Um, in Rwanda, images data have been used to develop a, a parent training, a gender transformative parent training model called Program P, Banda Barejo in Kenya, Rwanda, that is now being scaled up at the national level with the Ministry of Health. That's been a partnership as well along the way with the World Bank's Gender Innovation Lab. Um, that's an example of taking the data to say, what concretely do we need men to do in terms of reduction of violence at the household level and men's hands-on participation in care work? We've done a randomized control trial, found that data holds up five years later, using that data to then turn it into a nationally scalable program. Similarly, in Bolivia, carrying out the images survey, we're working with municipalities to implement youth-focused, gender-transformative, gender-based violence prevention. That's been a partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank. And again, to get more sophisticated about violence prevention and not say we just throw campaigns into the air, but we know which men have more likelihood of using violence. We know what things need to be in our programming to actually make a difference at the community level. What does it look like to scale that up at the municipal level? In the Republic of Georgia, we've worked to carry out images in two different moments to see whether a national campaign on social norms can make a difference. In partnership with UNFPA, um, carried out a national campaign on men's caregiving, making that normal for men to do it and looking at women's attitudes and men's attitudes. Four years later after that campaign, we did see shifts in, at the national level in attitudes about a belief that men should do more of the care work. We've also done some of this in post-conflict areas in a partnership again with the World Bank and in, D in Eastern DRC. And again, using data both to show that gender transformative interventions with men and boys work. And secondly, that we can engage with the public sector, um, sometimes with the UN, sometimes with the World Bank and always with governments to take it to scale. So big piece of advice is we need to take seriously that men need to be allies and see their personal interest in this. We've seen a lot of backlash happening in many parts of the world. We do need to reach men on why this is good for men. One of the social norm parts is that, to help men see our investment in gender equality. And the other is to see that to, to carry out data, to say there's very concrete things we meet, need men to do. As we look at, I heard your president refer to women, to uh, women policy in the law, women gender in the law rather. And I think that's an area where we need to build in data to say, are we seeing men change their behaviors? Are we carrying out that data over in, in, a, in a time series approach that we're actually measuring change. Thanks, so let me stop there. I know we're short for time. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, and thank you for reminding us. Um, 
accelerating progress towards gender equality is not just a women's cause, it's a women and men's cause together. Um, and, and thank you for this groundbreaking work that you've been leading. Thank you so much. Now let's uh, welcome uh, Dragana Dorad Todorovic. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Yeah. Uh, who is the executive director with strategic organizational and program focus at LGBT Equal Rights Association for Western Balkans and Turkey. Dragana, your leadership in increasing awareness and advancing the human rights of the LGBTI community is really inspirational. With this event, we also want to take the opportunity to push the development community further in terms of its commitment to ensuring dignity and inclusion of LGBTI persons and to taking a broader look at gender. Mm -hmm. Your work truly models for us what progress and engagement across stakeholders can look like. So we'd love to hear from you. What has been your approach to collecting and developing evidence mm -hmm. on the status of LGBTI rights in the Western Balkans and Turkey? And what is your advice for using this data to engage with policymakers on laws and their implementations that affect LGBTI persons and their well beings, their safety, and their empowerment? Well, thank you so much for these very interesting questions. And uh, also, thank you so much for this opportunity um, and also for including the LGBTI perspective in this uh, important event. I think these uh, interna in intersectional perspectives are, uh, uh, are very important. Um, and let me now give you a few words um, uh, about our experience with regards to collecting and leveraging uh, data on the lived realities of LGBTI persons in our region. Um, our organization is uh, actually a regional LGBTI network of, uh, of uh, now 82 LGBTI organizations from Western uh, Balkans and Turkey. And um, even though we have a very diversified work portfolio, uh, influencing policy reform processes based on data and evidence um, really forms a large part of what we do on a daily basis on the national, regional, uh, but also international levels. Um, and I can say that the first characteristics of data when it comes to our communities is that it has for a very long time and to a large extent been missing. Uh, when surveys concerning the socioeconomic situation of the population at large were conducted or uh, when, for example, violent uh, incidents were recorded, uh, the absence of desegregated data that take into consideration sexual orientation and gender identity have greatly uh, contributed to invisibilizing the structural uh, inequalities of our communities and as a consequence has allowed uh, authorities in our region to disregard systemic discrimination and widespread LGBTI phobic violence for far too long. Uh, therefore, for us as a community, data collection is the key to demonstrate and, and, and uh, convincingly convey to policymakers uh, our collective experience of discrimination, violence, and harassment, uh, and therefore to, to, to try to trigger a much needed response. Uh, it is for our communities, but also for, for the NGOs that represent them, a critical tool to make sure our concerns are no longer ignored. Uh, our approach has been to ensure the relevance of the data collected and also to facilitate uh, its analysis uh, and, and use, often uh, from a comparative perspective in comparison to the, to the experiences of the general population, uh, for example, or in comparison to other world regions or, or countries. Um, and concretely, uh, uh, over the past six years, the World Bank and ERA, uh, in partnership, uh, have collected critical evidence uh, uh, and this exercise that revealed something that we as a community already knew uh, that the situation for LGBTI people in the Western Balkan uh, countries is, is much worse than the experience of their peers uh, in other, uh, for example, EU countries or very different uh, uh, and worse than the experience of the, of the general population across um, nearly all uh, possible uh, dimensions. 
Uh, these studies have been uh, uh, some of the some of the very few pioneering efforts in our region, but also globally, uh, to provide data on different aspects of our lived realities, including also on the economic cost of discrimination, which actually is providing us with a new, unique set of evidence. Uh, that is uh, underlying the, the, the added value of anti-discrimination policies for the society uh, as a whole and proving once again that fostering inclusion benefits all as it correlates, as we have been able to hear from other speakers, as it correlates with a more prosperous society, with faster growing economies, uh, which is usually what decision makers in our region care about the most. And lastly, the importance of the support of the World Bank in this regard cannot be uh, overstated. Indeed, the legitimacy uh, uh, and uh, credibility bestowed on the reports stemming from these exercises uh, is to be credited to a large extent to the political weight uh, and, and the known rigor of a partner as influential and as highly regarded by national authorities in our region as the World Bank. So this collaboration has been uh, uh, truly instrumental in opening doors for the civil society, uh, securing a place for LGBTI NGOs at the table when policies affecting our lives and future are debated and strengthening the voices that were until then uh, left at the margins. And uh, I can only hope that this critical support of the World Bank will continue uh, as we are determined to continue our transformative advocacy based on rigorous and robust uh, data collection uh, methodologies. And I will end here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jagana, for, for your courageous leadership and really inspiring work and, and for reminding us the role of institutions such as the World Bank in effecting change. And we look forward to continue working with you all. And thank you too to Mick and Gary for your truly invaluable reflections. Uh, I, I believe that our uh, discussions in both panels underscore the notion that the gender data themselves are a form of women's and girls' empowerment because they help review reality, inspire change, accelerate uh, gender equality and improve lives by enabling bold activism, legal reforms, and the right policies and programs. So let's work together to advance the gender data agenda to accelerate progress towards gender equality. With that, let me now give the floor to World Bank Vice President for Human Development, Mamta Murthy, for her closing remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Haishan, and uh, thank you to our excellent panelists. It's uh, very hard to come after you uh, and, and make some concluding remarks, um, but I'm going to try. Um, we've had a very rich discussion. I think we all agree that uh, gender equality uh, is intrinsically the right thing to do, um, but I, I do feel that uh, the publication of the World Development Report on Gender and Development in 2012 was a watershed moment because it made the point that um, equality is not just about things that are intrinsically good, but it's also about smart economics. And I think that's a, that's a, a core message that we, we want to underline and stress and, and maintain. And we would not be able to do that without the power of data. So data allows us to constantly uh, reinforce and reignite the message that gender equality is, is um, in addition to being intrinsically good, it's also uh, economically the smart thing to emphasize. Um, now, we're one of those big institutions that Mick talked about. We are at the World Bank and, and um, we, have a, we have a role and a responsibility when it comes to, to data on gender. And, and I, I, I believe in the opening panel with President Malpass and, and Hannah, um, we, uh, the, the, the point was made that we are doing a lot in the sphere of gender and uh, uh, gender data. Uh, we try and support the collection of more and better data. And, and this is uh, through partnerships with statistical agencies, national statistical agencies, but also other actors. 
um, uh, in the field on uh, UN women, uh, civil society organizations, uh, advocacy groups, etc. And, and many of you were represented in today's panels. We believe this data provides crucial insights into both improvements and setbacks. Uh, that's the uh, and if I, I want, I love the word that uh, that that uh, one of the panelists used. I I think it was you, Mick, who said that that data actually sh uh, is the sunlight that that uh, uh, is the brings the disinfectant of sunlight uh, onto issues and and helps uh, ensure transparency and accountability for objectives that have been laid out by. Uh, by government and by societies. And, and that's, that's what we try to support as the World Bank. Now, we're painfully aware that data gaps inhibit progress on crucial development issues. Um, I think Rima uh, gave an excellent example of, of uh, the value of data in, in highlighting the issues faced uh, by workers in the informal sector. Our colleague Dragana from, from the Balkans highlighted the value of data in in, uh, in uh, um, bringing to light issues faced by the LGBTQ uh, community. So, so um, data plays a very important role in, in, in highlighting uh, uh, the, the gaps that inhibit progress on, on crucial development challenges. Um, now, we, we do two kinds of things to improve the quality, availability, and use of data. And let me just highlight them. Um, first is working uh, in partnership uh, to enhance the collection of data. This means working with national statistical agencies. It also means generating the global public goods, uh, collecting data and generating the global public goods that President Malpass talked about. There was a reference to women, business and the law. This is a very important annual publication of the World Bank. There's the Global Findex, which we also help produce, which is on financial in inclusion. And I can name many more things, enterprise surveys, the living standards measurement surveys, and, and, and so on. But the second thing we do, in addition to helping uh, collect data and improve the capacity to use data, we also invest in research and survey methods to improve the quality of the data itself. And again, this is done in partnership. And I, I want to highlight for you today two very important partnerships. One is on women's work and employment. And this is with the ILO, uh, the FAO, um, uh, as well as Data2x. Um, and then there are measures for advancing um, gender equality. And it's called MAGNET. It has a great uh, acronym. And this is led by um, the World Bank's Africa Region Gender Innovation Lab also our development economics research group, but it's done in collaboration with IFPRI, IRC, um, and, and Oxford University. Now, um, all of this data, uh, which is collected, is extremely useful in the work that we do with governments, supporting them either with technical assistance or financial assistance or both. And the purpose of this data is to help the World Bank implement its own gender strategy, which is trying to close four gaps. Um, uh, gaps in human endowments, uh, gaps in asset ownership, uh, gaps in labor force participation, and gaps in voice and agency. And, and a, a little bit like our colleague uh, Gary from, from uh, Promundo described, um, this data helps inform the design of, of projects and helps monitor whether project, projects are, are meeting their stated objectives. Um, I'd like to underline, uh, um, if, for example, in the area of human endowments, um, President Malpass talked about the, uh, the, the Sahel Women's um, uh, uh, Empowerment and Demographic Dividend Project in the, in the Sahel, and this is playing a very important role in reducing gender gaps by, by expanding access to sexual and reproductive health for adolescent girls and encouraging them to complete school and, and get employment. And this also works with um, men in in uh, uh, in the community and religious leaders, um, a bit along the, the the lines of what was being discussed uh, earlier by uh, our colleague from Promundo. Um, in the area of uh, encouraging labor force participation, I want to mention very briefly the work that we've been doing on uh, supporting uh, government programs that bundle cash with services. Uh, uh, such as literacy, such as such as uh, access to markets, and and this helps with the productive inclusion of 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 women. 
And we've also been working on a number of childcare initiatives because childcare is such a such a barrier to to accessing jobs, both in the formal and the informal sector. Finally, um, uh, let me let me just reflect. Sorry, I, someone's on the someone's on the line. Um, finally, let me just reflect that we have a very active uh, ongoing partnership in the area of of gender statistics. Um, uh, and and this is something that we intend to maintain and and build upon. This entire year, we have an initiative called Accelerate Equality, the purpose of which is to reflect on what the World Bank has done in the past 10 years on gender, and also to solicit ideas for what we should do in the coming 10 years. And so we really appreciate the engagement of everyone on uh, uh, in this initiative. Um, we've, as a part of this initiative, we've launched the, the World Bank Gender Data Portal. We hope it's useful to everyone. At the end of my remarks, you're going to have a very short video that walks you through the, the gender data portal, and I hope it shows you how exciting it is. Um, uh, in the, in the forward-looking part of, the, uh, of um, our work, uh, as we solicit inputs from all of you, I, I just want to say that we are very much going to reflect on what many of you said. Uh, to, uh, I was very struck by um, the call made by Dragana to to uh, think about the need for greater inclusion and 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 uh, Dragana, you've challenged us to go beyond very traditional notions of gender, and we take note of that. Um, uh, uh, Gary, I was very impressed by what you said about getting men and boys more concretely involved and 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 seeing them as a part of of the investments that need to be made to enhance gender equality. So, so we very much take note of that. Um, and, and Rima, you were very, uh, you were very uh, 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 clear that you are going to be asking us to do more, particularly for, for those who work in the informal sector. Um, and and uh, uh, we, uh, we've also taken note of that. Um, uh, finally, I, I want to uh, conclude by reflecting on what uh, uh, the Minister Mayet said from, from Egypt about uh, the importance of making sure that the legislative framework uh, is not only supportive of equality, but uses data to, to constantly update um, uh, um, uh, uh, so that there is continuous learning and, and, and laws are changed based on information and data. I think that is something that we as the World Bank would aspire to support everywhere. So with that, let me thank you once again for your participation and urge you to stay an extra two minutes so that we can, uh, you can leave, uh, you can see this short video that takes you through the gender, gender data portal. And I hope it inspires all of us to do more in this area. Thank you very much and goodbye. A brief diagnosis on the need for accurate and updated data on gender for better policies. Did you know that there are still some countries where women make up only 20% of the workforce? Accurate and updated gender data allows us to capture these gender inequalities and are essential for key decision makers to plan effective interventions and policies. The existence of this data portal and how you can access it. To make data on women and men, boys and girls more accessible and digestible, the World Bank Gender Data Portal puts over 900 indicators at your fingertips through visuals and stories. Here are some of its key features. Main things you can do on the portal. An improved search function helps you more easily find data and resources through key terms and abbreviations. A new data exploration tool allows you to explore and download all the data and create custom visuals with just a few clicks. You can customize the filters and economies to your needs and also view the data source and methodology. Country and region profiles provide you with a snapshot of gender equality across key indicators. The portal provides functionality on every page to easily share and download data and visuals in multiple formats. Interactive data stories explore different gender topics through storytelling and data visualizations that help highlight key insights from the data. The portal also summarizes the availability of gender data by country, topic, and indicators over various time periods. Lastly, a resource repository offers the latest guidance on data collection and free courses on data literacy and communicating gender statistics, among other things. What is the benefit of using the portal? Gender data holds the power to make the invisible visible. 
the portal plays a key role in making that happen by providing high quality data in easily understood formats to help our partners share and communicate the insights and pinpoint gender issues to prioritize the implementation and financing of gender programs and data collection efforts. 